high school graduate, facing the unknown world of college, returns to his family's cabin to retrieve the familiar objects of his childhood as a reminder of his happiest days. However, upon his arrival, the items are missing, most likely stolen. So he settles for salvaging scrap from a junkyard where, to his surprise, he finds the items he had been looking for. I just described the events of the brave little toaster. But we don't see the story from the young man's point of view. We see it from the perspective of the appliances, the mundane, everyday objects. This is their story. The Brave Little Toaster is not at all an obscure film. Everybody's seen it. It even has a bit of a cult following. And probably an actual religious cult following somewhere in Russia. Huh. But if it doesn't match my criteria, then why am I talking about it? Because I think it's a bit underappreciated. Most people see it in passing, not really paying close attention to the media that they are absorbing, even though Toaster tends to receive positive reviews from critics and casual moviegoers alike. But I'm gonna take it a step farther. I want to argue that this is one of the best animated, no, one of the best films ever made. Today, I'm gonna talk about one of my favorite cartoons and finally answer the question we've all been asking ourselves. What were these guys smoking when they thought of this one? The answer might surprise you. I've been in this town so long and back in the city I've been taken for a lost gun And I've known for a long, long time One day Thomas F. Dish woke up and said Ah, fuck it, I'm gonna write a children's book And voila! The Brave Little Toaster appeared in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction in 1980 Written as a children's fable, but intended for an adult audience, the critics regarded Dish's novella as absolutely dishlicious. Two years later, Disney bought the rights to the film and put it under the care of... some filmmaker, or it was, uh... Oh yeah, John Lasseter. And yes, this is the project that got Lasseter fired from Disney. Fresh from working on Tron, Lasseter and his colleagues became intrigued with the idea of overlaying hand-drawn characters on computer-generated backgrounds. They tested this method with Where the Wild Things Are, and then approached the studio with their mad plan. The only problem? The film would cost millions and millions of dollars. So Lasseter was canned, and the movie was moved to Hyperion Studios as an independent production under a new director. Lasseter's pocket-sized pal, Jerry Reese. Reese and company had little to work with in terms of plot or character, so the whole thing had to be built from the ground up. In the span of about four weeks. Now despite the rush, I gotta say that these are some of the most lively and vibrant characters ever put to screen. Which is especially impressive when you consider they're all inanimate objects. What makes these characters work so well anyways? For a start, the appliances all have their own physics and locomotion, making the believability of this universe a bit more attainable. And this is a movie universe that requires a lot of suspension of disbelief. Where are their chords half the time? Just answer me that. But who cares about physics or engineering or proper spelling? That's how you spell available, right? Now, this is a movie about character development. There is a specific chemistry to these characters. To understand the members of this capacitor crucible situation, I like to think of them as representing the Kubler-Ross five stages of grief. Denial. I guess we can assume that it wasn't him, right? Anger. So just back off. Bargaining. I'll do anything. Bread. I can get you bread. Depression. I don't like to work without the master. And acceptance. We're going out to find him. Because, you know, the story wasn't depressing enough without me adding that layer of melancholy. And man, is this melancholy. Our gang faces abandonment and obsolescence, which... In their case, I assume to mean death. Sure, they could wait around for a new master to buy their cabin and make use of them, but they like their old guy and they're not ready to move on. Hence, the Kubler Ross thing I brought up. However, none of this would shine without the snappy dialogue. The five protagonists bounce the dialogue off each other faster than a bullet ricocheting in a metallic room. Such deliveries require just the right talent. Jerry Reese approached regular voice actors for this film, but supposedly the read-through sounded terrible. So he went to legendary improv group The Groundlings and recruited a few actors for the film. Add a little throw of Ravenscroft into the mix and they're great! I mean, after all, you go up to a classical actor and tell them they're gonna play a radio that wants to be the center of attention and they'll look at you like, 
what the hell kind of movie is this? But you go up to an improvisational actor and tell them they'll be playing a lamp that thinks it's smarter than it is, and they'll be like, okay, now give me a setting. Two of the actors were then little known names, John Lovitz and the late Phil Hartman. Two weeks into production, both men were hired by Saturday Night Live, so their recording session was a bit rushed. Lovitz, for instance, recorded all his lines in one long marathon session, but honestly, he sounds so natural and present in each scene, you can never tell. Look at this opening scene. Right, folks, we seem to be experiencing a little technical difficulty, but I'm sure it's nothing we can't handle. Oh, this just in. Domestic bedroom violence erupts in peaceful Woodland Cottage. We'll keep you posted. Ooh. Can't even hear your own thoughts around here with all the racket around here. How is it that a lamp sounds more lifelike than a lot of actors on the TV screen? Meanwhile, Phil Hartman gives one of the best performances as Jack Nicholson as an air conditioner. Optimistic. Somebody untie the knot in this guy's cord. Here we have a paranoid and practically invalid character, driven insane by his immobility and scornful of the hope that he has been denied. Wow, we're getting into some southern gothic territory here. Uh, hey kids, look, Dancing Frogs, isn't that cute? You think I don't know what's going on in here? I know what goes on in this cottage. It's a conspiracy. And every one of you low watts is in on it. Just cause you can move around, you think you're better than I am. We witness the air conditioner grow from petty cynic to full-blown psycho until he eventually, metaphorically, explodes literally. And no, despite what the almighty internet says, the air conditioner does not commit suicide. He has a heart attack. Circuit attack. Whatever attack. To which Kirby has the best response. I didn't know he'd take it so hard. Well, he was a jerk anyway. Shit, that is one stone cold vacuum. As for the plot, well, what can I say about the plot? It's the Odyssey. Like, the Odyssey. Not a direct adaptation or anything, but, you know, the structure is there. Our heroes start on the Trojan shores and set sail across the green pastures of a brave new world with hope in their hearts. This is where we get the first of four original songs, City of Light. Oh, technically the first song is Tutti Frutti by Little Richard, which plays during the opening scenes, setting the happy tone to contrast the peril and heartache that comes later in the story. But I like the use of Tutti Frutti. More animated films need to utilize the classics. That's what makes them classic. I would have enjoyed Brave more if it had like a Fat Domino montage. That wouldn't have seemed out of place at all now, wouldn't Life is like a journey on a road that's within. The head says you should stay, but your heart says to begin. So that City of Lights is a nice enough song, utilizing the best of Baroque pop music. It was written by legendary songster Van Dyke Parks. Who is Van Dyke Parks, you ask, you uncultured swine? Well, listening to this song, is it any surprise that he was one of the collaborators on Brian Wilson's mythical album Smile? Listen to those pastoral strings. I used to not like this song as a kid, but now I have a better appreciation for it. It's corny as hell, but lovably so. And speaking of music, composer David Newman deserves some credit for creating a hugely underrated cinematic score. Just listen as the poppy spirited song dissolves into an ominous orchestration of foreboding. The characters enter a forest of tangled brush and thorns, reflecting the inner turmoil of their emotions. It's a tense scene, and a tense night. Then out of nowhere, dancing frogs! <laughs> this whole section feels like it's from another movie, a lost silly symphony. Our mighty heroes have reached the Lotus Eaters, a natural world that promises happiness, joy, and pleasure. But as time goes on, we realize that our appliances aren't meant for this garden of e-works, and so they continue with their journey. But this is also where the most infamous scene in the film occurs. The flower. As the toaster hides from the rambunctious rodents, he comes across a yellow blossom that becomes infatuated with its reflection and is devastated by its loss. This is a big turning point for the toaster. He realizes that he can't help everyone, 
particularly those under the spell of a delusion. However, he tries harder to save those that he can. The Blanket, for instance, who he had formerly thrown under the rug. Blanket rug, you know what I'm saying. The flower is a narcissist, and literally a narcissist, and no happiness will come to those who think of only themselves, foreshadowing the film's climactic finale. After seeing that, I doubt anyone can argue against this being an art film. It's tender and heartbreaking, and so beautifully realized. Now how many children does this scene traumatize for life? Let's go to the counter! Aye! We're not even done yet. The Odyssey continues into dark, scary places where the gang must cope with thunderstorms, rescue missions, waterfalls, and scary clown dreams. Ha! New high score. After a daring rescue on the part of Kirby, oh, and in case you were wondering, Kirby is named after the Kirby Sanatronic vacuum cleaner, an actual product from the late 60s. I can only assume all Kirbys were named after this thing. Anyways, after a daring rescue, our heroes fall to their lowest point and enter a proverbial hell via this marsh. See, the mud is the portal to the underworld, where they are accosted by what appears to be a sentient jelly bean who goes by the name Elmo St. Peter. That's right, he's named after the gatekeeper of heaven, Elmo. I mean, St. Peter. Just as Odysseus and Aeneas entered the land of the dead, so too does our crew of appliances enter a back room of the damned. Well, 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 how do we escape? Did you hear that, boys? They want to know how to escape. <laughs> Here's where we get the second original song, B-Movie Show. Just try to relax. It's the House of Wax. With horror movie homage after homage, this is a fun theatrical song that reinvigorates the viewer after the gloomiest point in the story. But they cheat death once again and escape with their new carriage toward the electric shores of the nameless city, where we discover that the Master Rob has grown up into a Silicon Valley motherfucker. Remember the Odyssey when Odysseus returns home and finds a bushel of bachelors hitting on his wife? It's kind of what's going on here, except with appliances. Everything's with appliances. Our gang arrives at Rob's apartment and finds that the master has new appliances, including this behemoth. Who own these kinds of entertainment centers anyways? Unfortunately, the master is away, cruising around in his red convertible with his hot girlfriend. I'm starting to hate this guy. We. Oui are on the cutting edge of technology. Ah, now it's time for the most ruthlessly 80s song in the soundtrack. Cutting edge, where all the appliances brag about how edgy and innovative they are and telephone, why are you singing about being cutting edge? You're an older invention than all the other appliances. So the cottage has an old fashioned black and white TV but no telephone? Man. Vacation sucks. I wanna go home, play my Coleco Vision. The song seems horribly cheesy and dated nowadays, but you had to have been in the 80s. At the time, the bleeps and bloops and voice filters were, well, cutting edge. And how appropriate that a song about technology would be the one to age horribly. Just as all these machines have been obsolete for decades. Live fast, die young, I guess. And more. After the finale, our heroes get cast out to the land of forgotten souls. Hades. Dees. The Dump. In this valley of death, we get the final and most remembered song. Worthless. Wow, I barely even said anything. Can't take this kind of pressure. I must confess, one more dusty road would be just a road too long. In case you've never heard Worthless, the lyrics are performed by various cars who reflect on their lives right before. Yeah. It's at this point in the film that you know for a fact that the filmmakers ain't fucking around. Death is a major part of life, and they give it the acknowledgement it deserves. Of all the songs, this is the most respectable, as well as the most harrowing. 
However, the song is broken up by these TV segments, used to lighten the mood and keep the sequence from being overwhelmingly dismal. Of, of total bargain madness! <laughs> But let's talk about the villains. Well, if you can call them that. First you have the Crusher. Now I say this in complete seriousness. There has been no greater depiction of the medieval Hellmouth in a film than the Crusher from the Brave Little Toaster. It just sits there, opening and closing, consuming all the damned souls that meet its maw, sending them into oblivion in a neat and tiny little cube. Then there's the Magnet, the Gatekeeper of Hell, a silent, stoic creature that doesn't take shit from anyone. Look how angry he is. He's not even afraid of killing a human if they get in the way of his function. Which is actually what happens to Rob. This movie was made in the 80s, when there was an unwritten rule that a color filter had to be used to make things extra scary. See? The toaster escapes the conveyor belt and climbs atop a pile of cars that we can assume are just corpses since they aren't responding. That's grim. You can say that none of the cars in the song attempted to escape because they felt hopeless, worthless, but the toaster saw the master and felt optimistic once again. His love and devotion will lead him to do crazy things, such as diving into the gears of the infernal machine. And that's something that's always struck me as unique about this film. The brave little toaster ends with the hero sacrificing himself for his friends which is a stark contrast to the numerous Disney and Disney-esque films that would follow, where the climax is resolved by the death of the villain. I always found something more endearing about Toaster's End. He gives his life and is gifted with some great reward. Available now on Compact Disc. It's the kind of selfless act you could really make a religion out of. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Toast, Amen. The Brave Little Toaster was a real work of love for director Jerry Reese and company. They went so far as traveling to Taiwan for six months to supervise the animation, a thing rarely done in overseas productions. When the film was completed, it was shown at the Sundance Film Festival. Let me repeat that. The Sun Dances with Fucking Pretentious Film Snob People Festival. And you know what? It got rave reviews from the judges. Though it did not win anything, many festival judges would later comment that they were worried the validity of Sundance would be diminished if this little children's cartoon beat out such masterpieces like Rob Nilsson's Heat and Sunlight, which boasts a 47% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's a conspiracy. Oh, and Disney almost screwed this movie over completely. Disney had long had rights over the film, but they opted out of a theatrical release and instead gave Toaster a Disney Channel premiere. Reese and company were dismayed and believed the project had met the fate of obscurity. After all, who watches that newfangled Disney Channel anyways? Remember, the Disney Channel was a little different back then. Less high school musical, more high school teacher awards. So it seemed all the hard work had been for nothing. Fast forward to several years later, Reese started noticing children's drawings in schools or in his colleagues' offices. Some of the characters looked really familiar. A little blue box with a smiling face. That's when he learned that all the hard work had finally paid off. He'd found his audience. Oh, and the VHS sold a lot of copies, so there's that too. And now I want to answer the question that I posed earlier. What were these guys smoking when they thought of this one? Creativity. They were high on creativity and a little hash to get started, but mostly creativity. An animated film that appealed to all age ranges had not been accomplished since the golden days of Disney. You had the ultra-child-friendly films of Don Bluth, the adult-oriented sex fest of Ralph Bakshi, and Disney, no, seemed to be in the gutters. A lot of people credit The Little Mermaid and Roger Rabbit with revitalizing the animation industry, but who knows? Perhaps if Disney executives hadn't noticed the appeal of a little toaster, then Little Mermaid might not have been made. And that would have been a little disappointing. The Brave Little Toaster is a film that has it all. Child appeal, adult appeal, comedy, drama, suspense, coming of age, satire, adventure, and catchy, catchy music. It's an art film, a musical, a character drama, a road trip, a buddy comedy, a horror movie, an incredible journey, and definitely a film that can be seen again and again. I think what some people find so unsettling about this film is that it makes us take into account all the little things in our lives. This camera, for instance. It doesn't work, but I've had it all my life. It doesn't even have a backstory, it's just always been there. And I 
can't seem to get rid of it. There exists ancient Japanese folklore about yokai, which are spirits or ghosts or whatever you want to call them. The word derives from the kanji for otherworldly and weird. One certain type of yokai is called the sukumogami, which refers to a household object that has gained a soul on its 100th birthday. That's why you'll often see Japanese prints with a living umbrella or lantern. You gotta imagine, with that kind of folklore, somewhere along the line, someone wrote a story called The Brave Little Saki Jar. The origins of the Sukumogami tales are a bit clouded, but considering it is part of the Shingon Buddhism, I can assume the legends were formed to warn against wastefulness, to teach people to cherish the objects they own, rather than covet the things they don't. A good lesson for 1980s America, wouldn't you say? And that seems to be the effect of the Brave Little Toaster. Kids grew up with a sense that their items have feelings, but that obsolescence is part of the cycle. Love what you own, while you own it. After all, you don't want to create a generation of hoarders. Or do you? But just like Odysseus, after his homecoming, the toaster wasn't done. He set off on new adventures, to save animals, and to travel to Mars in the two sequel films. But those are fucking awful. We're gonna ignore those. For now. What a beautiful face I have found in this place that is circling all around the sun. Trivia time! Director Jerry Reese, along with classmates John Lasseter and Brad Bird, went to Cal Arts, which is located on McBean Parkway. 2470 McBean Parkway. Where they had class in room A113. A113. This is it. Your knowledge has been enriched. In the name of the Father, the son, the brother, the sister, the daughter, the sister, the daughter, my sister, my daughter, my sister, my daughter, my sister, my daughter, my sister, and my daughter, and the Holy Toast. Amen.